What's up, everyone? Welcome to this day in Philly Sports History for September 27th, 2024. I'm your host, Jim Montgomery. Welcome to a Feel Good Friday edition of the podcast, a Feel Good Friday episode. And this is our 750th episode of this podcast. Amazing to think about over two years and I haven't missed a day in 750 days. I've missed my day job a lot more than I've missed the podcast, but it's a testament to you. Thank you. Here's to the next 750. Uh, but just wanted to mention that 750. It's uh, pretty impressive. But be sure to follow me on social media. Let's continue to grow this thing as we go into the next 750. Jimbo underscore Mott on Twitter and TikTok. At Philly Jimbo on Instagram. Subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't done so already. Jimbo underscore Mont. And just spread the word. That's the best way to get things going. Spread the word. If you're enjoying it, likely that means somebody else will too. So spread the word and let's continue to grow. If you need information on the Philadelphia Sports Hall of Fame, information is in the description. November 7th is when the ceremony is. Big induction class this year. Working on a few things for them too. Uh, but anything you need is there in the description. And then just previewing some of the stuff we have coming up. I mentioned this yesterday. In October, starting Monday. Yeah, no, Tuesday. Starting Tuesday, we're going to look at the best Phillies postseason games. So kind of get all of those moments that we all know and love and get ready for Red October. And then we'll preview the Sixers later in the month and end up the month with starting our Philly Sports Hall of Fame uh, preview as we head into that induction ceremony. So lots on the horizon. Spread the word. Be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel as well. And then check out my boys over at the Clash and Conferences podcast. They came out a day early for football due to the game last night, which we'll have some stuff on that in a minute. Uh, Great baseball content. Anxious to see what Mike has to say about the doubleheader coming up, which technically I didn't check the scores from last night, but might not mean anything. Both of those teams might actually be in before the doubleheader. The National League playoff is wide open right now, so thank God we got that by. Uh, But that is available wherever you get your podcast as well as on YouTube. Philly Goat has a new shirt out as well. It's a Broad and Patterson shirt. Uh, It is designed by Brian Garber, who is a tattoo artist at Wizard World of Tattoos. It's an awesome shirt. Go check it out. Got to to get the Believe shirt. Got to believe as we head into the postseason. I told you the players wear it. My daughter wears it. So should you. All of that and plus more is available on phillygoat.com. Go check it out. Get ready for Red October. And be sure to use the promo code Jim Montgomery to take 10% off your order and let Ryan and the team know that you listen to this day in Philly sports history like all the cool kids. All right. Phil's tonight down in D.C. Ranger Suarez on the mound. I'm looking for just some improvement with him, more consistency, because I think everybody's talking about the bats and Castellano staying hot and cutting down the strikeouts and all of these different things with the bats. But to me, the key to this postseason run is going to be Ranger. He's been so good in the postseason in the past. It started off such good, so good the start of this year. And then once he got the injury, it sort of hasn't been back to the same. So I would love to see him come out and, and give us some confidence and, and look good heading into the postseason. But I think under the radar, he might be the key to this postseason run. The magic number with three games left for that number one seed is four. Um, and its I don't think it matters. I mean, I personally, everybody keeps saying they don't want to play the Diamondbacks. And yes, the Diamondbacks had our number. But I, I just think there's – I can't see this team losing again to the Diamondbacks. Just the way they their mindsets are. Uh, I would be more worried, and I know this might be an unpopular opinion. The Mets scare me more than any team – in the postseason right now Um, and the Mets might not even get in or they might be depleted or spent so I I mean personally that's the team that's been hot sort of like how the Phillies were in back in 2022 so that's the team that scares me more so than anyone but it's the postseason you're you're gonna have to beat these teams anyway so I don't think it matters who we play Uh, but Yesterday, I asked you, what are you more concerned about with them having to buy the bats going cold or the pitching? 
And 81% of you said it was the bats. And I think that's what everybody's concern is because that's what's done the Phillies in the past two years anyway. But thank you, as always, for participating in the question of the day. There will be another one here later in the show. But tonight it's Ranger Suarez down in D.C. Uh, The Phillies are looking to possibly get that one seed. It's going to be a fun weekend of baseball. Lots of good pennant races. I think the Dodgers pretty much, uh, I don't know if they clinched last night, but for the most part, I think they are in the driver's seat for that division. I think they just need to win one game. Let me check the standings real quick. Uh, But who knows what they're going to do, like whether or not they want that one seed or not. I Again, it, it doesn't matter one way or the other to me, but it. Uh, I guess the Dodgers did clinch the division last night. Yep, they're up four with three to play. So there you go. So it comes down to the Dodgers Phillies for that one seed. Uh, let's do it. All right. Eagles news, not a lot coming out. Uh, no lane, Devontae or AJ at practice yesterday, as we expected. I, I think they're. I, I, I can't see Devontae or Lane playing. And it comes down to AJ. And I'm, I'm not, just not sure what to make of that. If he's 100%, absolutely play him. It, it's one of those things. But if I feel if he's not 100%, why bring him back with the bye next week? And I, I don't want to call it a scheduled loss like Doc Rivers used to. But sort of uh, put the pressure on the, the guys like Jahan Dotson and uh, Johnny Wilson, Paris Campbell, like those guys. I mean, they. it's always coming into the season. We said if Devontae and AJ go down, we're going to be in trouble. And how he went out, got Jahan Dotson. So it's time for him to really step up. Uh, we'll see more Goddard, I'm sure, more Barkley. Uh, but I would not play AJ if he's not 100%. But what do you think? If he's not 100%, do you sit AJ or put him in there because Devontae likely isn't going to play? 267-495-8531. That is the Back to the Future voice and text line. Get your answer to that and anything else Philly sports related off of your chest. Uh, but would you sit AJ if he's not 100%? Even if he's 95%, I would set him because it's soft tissue, man. There's soft tissue injuries, especially hamstrings. That could be something that lingers throughout the season. Give him two more weeks off and have him come back after the bye. Because the schedule after the bye is pretty as it stands right now. Who knows with the way the NFL has been this year. But the schedule is pretty manageable coming out of the bye. So rest him. No need to to put him in harm's way. I mentioned uh, the the Cowboys-Giants. 20-15 Cowboys beat the Giants. Uh, eh, Whatever. I mean, I don't think either one of these teams are any good, to be completely honest. Cowboys are 2-2. Two and two. That's the only reason I'm really bringing it up, because if the Eagles were to lose, they would be tied with Washington and or uh, Dallas, and then depending on what Washington does, could be a three-way tie for first place. But I don't know. Uh, yeah, Giants-Cowboys. And I tried to watch the game. I was tr- well. I wanted to flip between that and the Temple game, which, gosh, Temple is bad. It was like a one-off win the other day. They got smoked by Army, but uh, it's just so hard. And it, it's not just Amazon. I'm not going to single out Amazon. It's all the games that go, get put on these stupid apps. It's it's impossible to flip. Like I, I paid a ridiculous amount of money to have all of this content, and I can't. I, I have to. Exit out. Go to the next. There has to be a better way, people. There has to be a better way. If there's a better way, let me know. But I ended up turning off because I'm like, I'd rather watch Temple get beat by Navy than the Cowboys Giants. Uh, But if there's a better way to flip between the apps, let me know because I cannot figure it out. And now I feel like my dad uh, back when we first got remote controls. But this is where we are. Is there a better way? There has to be. And if there's not, can somebody please invent it? Like people invent all this ridiculous stuff that we don't need. This is something we need. Like use your powers for good. God, it's impossible. 
Flyers, 2-0 win over the Islanders yesterday. Yes, it was preseason, but Mishkov mania was running wild down at the Wells Fargo Center. He had a goal and an assist. The goal was an empty netter, but he I, I watched some of the highlights. Man, like his playmaking and just uh, ice vision is second to none, man. Like some of the passes he was making, this dude is going to be good and I'm all here for it. Uh, but Mishkoff Mania, I think we just coined the new term. Mishkoff Mania, what you gonna do? Uh, Sam Erson was good in goal, 37 saves. Uh, that's gonna be another guy that's gonna be key to this season, but things are looking good in Flyers land as Mishkoff Mania was running wild down at the Wells Fargo Center. Okay, today is a big day in Philly's football history. The first ever NFL game was played in Philadelphia on this day back in 1924, and it wasn't the Eagles. It was the Frankfurt Yellow Jackets. The Frankfurt Yellow Jackets were the first NFL franchise from Philadelphia, and on this day they beat the uh, Rochester Jeffersons 21-0 up at Frankfurt Stadium, which is on the corner of, or was on the corner of Frankfurt and Devereux. In 1925, they went, <coughs> excuse me, 1924, they went 17-3-1 with an 11-2-1 and mark in the NFL en route to a third place finish. And the game was different back then. So they, the NFL had their teams and it was more like a college type schedule. So they, the NFL games were sort of like their in-conference games. And then they would just play different uh, semi-pro teams, some college teams. And those games counted toward their final record, but did not count in the NFL standings. So they went 11-2-1 in the NFL that first season. They would actually play two games uh, a weekend. They would play Saturday at home up in Frankfurt. And then uh, Sunday they had to go on the road because of the Pennsylvania Blue Laws. If you remember, we talked about uh, Connie Mack a couple weeks ago where he was like, screw it, I'm playing a baseball game on Sunday. Uh, but back to that 1924 Frankfurt Yellow Jacket team, they set an NFL record for rushing touchdowns in a season, which ironically was broken by the Eagles back in 2022, if you count playoff games. So the, the Eagles had more rushing touchdowns than the Frankfurt Yellow Jackets, but that's how long that record stood. Uh, and that does include postseason too. But the, the Yellow Jackets were one of the most dominant teams in the NFL in the early days. They won the championship in 1926. And then, like most teams and most entertainment outlets, they became a victim of the Depression. It was hard for them to... When people don't have money, they're not going to go watch a football game. And then to complicate matters, their stadium burnt down in 1931 which at that point they had to, to go on the road for all their games. And obviously they weren't getting that gate revenue. So they ended up folding after the 1931 season. After no football in Philadelphia in 1932, that led to the Eagles being added to the NFL in 1933. It also coincided with the peeling back of some of the PA Blue Laws. So it was sort of like the, the perfect storm. But the Frankfurt Yellow Jackets played the first NFL game in Philadelphia on this day back in 1924. Uh, and they were, one, like I said, one of the more dominant teams uh, and won the championship in 1926. The, the Eagles were, if you remember back in 2007, I, the Donovan McNabb, Kevin Curtis era, they wore the, those our, our yellow and blue throwbacks. Those were Frankfurt Yellow Jacket uniforms, and the original uniforms of the Eagles were also the yellow and blue. So it was sort of like a an homage to them, as well as the city of Philadelphia. That's the the color of the city of Philadelphia's flag, which I don't know if a lot of people know that. I, somebody asked me that the other day uh, about those uniforms or why the uh, the Phillies City Connect jerseys are the light blue. And I was explaining it was trying to be in yellow because of the Philadelphia flag. They're like, oh, I did not know that. So if you didn't know, now you know. But yes, that is why the Frankfurt Yellow Jackets were the yellow and blue. It was in part because of, if you ever look at City Hall or uh, any of the press conferences down with City Council or the mayor, there's the yellow and blue flag. That's the City of Philadelphia flag. This is the civics portion of the show today. Uh, 
but uh, some the the like Yellow Jackets did leave a long legacy. Like I said, they did lead to the the Eagles being into the NFL. Lou Molinette was the first NFL's the NFL's first Latino player played for the Yellow Jackets. Uh, Philadelphia Fire Department Engine 14 up in Frankfurt has the has adopted the Yellow Jackets moniker on their all of their engines and things like that. So that's pretty cool. But all because on this day back in 1924, the Frankfurt Yellow Jackets beat the Rochester Jeffersons 21 nothing up in Frankfurt Stadium in the first ever NFL game in the city of Philadelphia. All right, this one was a tough one for me. Today's Philly sports villain, and this guy was one of the few people on this list and probably the only person on this list who went from a Philadelphia villain to a hero before he passed away, and that is Kobe Bryant. And to me, it all started back when he was at Lower Marion. Uh, I hated him then because he beat us in the playoffs two years in a row when I was at Coatesville. Uh, Rip Hamilton was our star, and they always battled. And I think much like uh, I always tell people, and this is kind of a little sidebar here. I always tell folks that Philly has like a chip on its shoulder because it, it, it they feel like they're uh, like get jealous of like New York and Boston, like the little brother syndrome or like uh, feel like they don't belong. And it's like they're inferior or they're treated like we're inferior. Well, in Coatesville, it's kind of the same way. And I felt as though. Uh, with that, during that time frame, Rip was good, but we all knew Kobe was good, but we felt like, no, Rip is our guy and forget Kobe. Rip is just as good as Kobe, uh, which side note, I think Rip Hamilton should be in the pro basketball hall of fame. But, uh, for me, that's when it started and just beating us in the playoffs two years in a row, just doing ridiculous things and then taking Brandy to the prom. And yes, it was probably a lot of jealousy and misguided feelings but whatever i was in high school uh and then doing the the press conference with the sunglasses on the, the oakley's on his head and all of that um and then again he claimed to be from philly but he didn't live in philly he lived in lower marion which if you know anything about it and i i've, I've softened on this a bit over the years but i used to get mad at villanova saying they're not a philly school they're on the main line but they're close enough but when you're claiming that that's where you're from, it's different. You're you're not from Philadelphia. As somebody who's lived in Philadelphia and is not originally from Philadelphia, trust me, you're not. He wasn't from Philly. He was from Lower Marion. Um, and be proud of where you're from. I mean, I still tell people it's even if I don't know if they're not going to know where it is. I'll say I'm from Coatesville, and then say right outside of Philly, and then if they know that, it was like you know Westchester. So be proud of where you're from. And I think that was one of the other reasons he was a villain. He claimed to to be from Philly, but he wasn't. And if you know anything about people in Philly, don't bullshit them because they're going to know. Um, obviously, then he goes to the Lakers, who are the Sixers uh, from the early to mid-80s. were a big rival in the Western Conference with the Sixers. And as fate would have it, we played each other in the 2001 NBA Finals. And he flat out said, "We're going to cut. I'm going to cut your hearts out." Uh, so, and that was part of what made Kobe Kobe, though. I, I will give him credit for that. But at the time, we didn't want to hear that. We we're like, "Screw you! You're the the sellout who went to L.A., Mr. Big Time Hollywood, and all that." So, rightfully so, he got booed at the All Star Game the following year, even though he won the MVP. Said, "I'm coming home," and I remember it all the time. People were like, "You're not coming home. You're not from." Philly, go back to Italy, go back to LA, and he would even say, "I'm I'm, gonna, I'm from LA," and um, it was all a part of gamesmanship. And uh, he thought he'd wear his dad's jersey, the Sixers jersey, the All Star game. Did not matter. It was booed. Um, and then there, there's 90s kids like me who grew up with Jordan, who uh, still to this day is the goat. But then Kobe was making a legitimate claim to being the goat, and a, a lot of people were Jordan fans. Didn't want to hear that. Um, and I think Kobe even at one point uh, maybe indirectly said that he was the GOAT. Uh, and that is one of those things. So all of those reasons, for obvious reasons, and obvious he became a, a villain in Philly. So when did it all change? And I think part of it was 
LeBron James and everybody anointing him. And even to this day, everybody talks about LeBron and Jordan and just gloss over Kobe like Kobe was just another guy. And let me tell you, Kobe was not just another guy. Um, For me, that's what started because I I will go to my grave saying LeBron is not the GOAT. I don't care what anybody says. He does not have that killer mentality. Is he a top three player of all time? Possibly, likely, but he is not the GOAT. And that's a whole other issue, another story we can get into again. But that to me is when things started to soften for me because him and MJ were just different. And going back and looking at it, like those guys had just a different mentality. I mean, you saw him with Kobe when he leveled Pal Gasol in the, the Olympics, even though they were best friends. Like, he's like, I don't care. First play of the game, leveled him and just sort of set the tone. And like, you don't necessarily see that. And I think when he was coming up at Lower Marion and even with the Lakers, that's sort of what got him to where he was and why he sort of wasn't beloved in Philly. Because he's like, screw it. I don't have time to pander to fans, this, that, and the other, because I'm trying to win titles. And... Obviously, you, you become, as you get older and start to look, you appreciate what he brought to the, the court. Got a good uh, uh, appreciation and ovation in his last game in Philly. Uh, and then once he retired, I think that's when things started to change. And he embraced being an Eagles fan, gave them a pep talk when they were out in L.A. in 2017. And I think, to me, the, the kicker and the thing that got me was seeing him with that pure joy and pure excitement after the Eagles won the Super Bowl. And that, to me, is what won me over. Unfortunately, gone too soon. But I think it was more, we were jealous that he wasn't on one. He wasn't on the Sixers and jealous that it was our guy winning titles in L.A. Uh, but again, as passionate as we are, we're not stupid. I think once he, once he retired, we realized... This dude's pretty good, and I will put him right up there just behind Michael Jordan in the GOAT conversation ahead of LeBron James. I don't care what you think or what you say. Deal with it. Michael, LeBron, or Michael, Kobe, LeBron, and then Magic. And I might even put, eh, maybe not. Let's not get into that. But Kobe Bryant is today's Philly sports villain, more so from when he played And one of the few guys who was a Philly sports villain and became a hero. Gone too soon. Who who, would have thought I'd give a Kobe Bryant appreciation post on this podcast? Lots of crazy things have happened in 750 episodes. This is right up there with him. But Kobe Bryant is today's Philly sports villain. Uh, Rest in peace, Kobe, the Black Mamba. Uh, Not many guys out there like him. So he is our Philly sports villain. On this day in 1924, the Frankfurt Yellow Jackets played the first NFL game in Philadelphia. They beat the Rochester Jeffersons 21-0, and they were the precursor to the Philadelphia Eagles uh, a few years later, nine years later to be exact. We'll have more on the Eagles as they gear up for Tampa Bay tomorrow. Be sure to let me know your thoughts on whether or not they should sit AJ or not. 267-495-8531. That's the Back to the Future voice and text line. Want to talk Kobe, Mike, and Ed, uh, LeBron? Go ahead. Let's let's have some fun here on a Friday. Who's your goat? That's a little bit of a bonus question. Um, and then tell me wh- who's your goat and why is it Michael Jordan? 267-495-8531. Phil's Nats tonight. I want to see a solid effort out of Ranger Suarez tonight. Rooting against the Dodgers so we can get that one seed and have everything go through Citizens Bank Park. Go have yourselves a Friday. It is a feel-good Friday. This has been This Day in Philly Sports History for September 27th, 2024. My name is Jim Montgomery, and until next time, I'll see you when I see you.